let's start by talking about uh, the second of the two cases where firms choose quantities. That was the Stackelberg case, where there's a leader who announces how much they're going to produce first, and um, a follower that uh, then decides how much to produce as well. Okay. And sort of to lead into that topic, I have a question for you. Okay. The question is, and we don't actually have a poll here because this is a recorded lecture, but I still want you to try to think about what the answer will be. So the question is, in the classic Stackelberg duopoly model, two firms have identical cost functions, but it is assumed one firm decides how much it will produce first. The other firm, which we call the follower firm, then observes how much the first firm plans to produce, and based on that information decides how much it will produce. Okay, we'll call that Q2. The market price is then the price which clears the market at the total quantity that both firms plan to produce. And so the question that I have for you is which firm earns higher profits? The firm which acts first, that announces how much it's going to produce, or the firm which acts second, which gets to see how much the first firm is going to produce and then decide how much they want to produce in response. Okay, so think about that for about 30 seconds or a minute, and uh, then we'll move forward. Okay, so the typical notation that we're going to use is that we're going to denote the amount that a single firm produces using a lowercase q. Okay? And then the subscript is gonna tell us which firm. So in the Stackelberg case, we have a leader which announces and commits to producing a certain amount first. And we're gonna denote the amount that they announce and then subsequently produce uh, by a lowercase q with an L subscript, okay? The follower then observes the leader's output and then decides how much it wants to produce in response, an amount that we're going to denote with a lowercase q with an F subscript. Okay? And then the total amount that's produced in this market is just the sum of the amounts produced by the leader and the follower. We'll denote the total quantity produced in this market with an uppercase q. And this total quantity produced is what determines the market price. Okay? We assume that these two products are identical, and so we can just use the inverse demand curve to figure out what is the corresponding price uh, for that total quantity produced. Okay, so that's the basic setup. And the way we're gonna solve this problem is first we're going to derive a function, which we call the reaction function for the follower, that tells us how much the following firm is going to produce as a function of how much the leader produces, right? So for any amount the leader produces, the follower can figure out what quantity it wants to produce in response to maximize its profits. Okay? So the amount that maximizes the follower's profits is some function of how much the leader announces that it's going to produce. Okay? And that's the first step of solving this problem is to find the follower's reaction function. Okay, so let's look at how you actually find the follower's reaction function. So let me start by assuming some particular numbers for this problem. So let's assume that the inverse demand curve is given by uh, price is equal to 30 minus the total quantity Q produced in the market, which if you recall, the total quantity produced is just the sum of the amounts uh, produced by the two firms. So we can rewrite that as 30 minus QL minus QF, okay? And to simplify this problem, we're going to use a assumption that we typically won't use, but we'll assume that the cost for a given firm I, that's for either firm of producing any quantity lowercase Q, is equal to zero. So we assume there are no costs, hence maximizing revenue in this example is the same thing as maximizing profits. Okay. So now let's start by writing down the profit function of the follower. So we're gonna say uh, the profit function of the follower is going to be equal to the quantity that the follower produces times the market price. But we know what the price is from the inverse demand curve. And so we can plug that in. So 
the profits can be written as a quantity produced by the follower times the market price, which is 30, minus the amount produced by the leader, minus the amount produced by the follower. And we're not subtracting off any costs here because we've assumed that costs are zero. Okay. So then what do we always do with these types of problems? If we're trying to figure out how much a, um, how much a, uh, 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 the firm should produce to maximize its profits, well, we have the profit function. And so we're gonna take the derivative and set it equal to zero. Okay, so we're, what are we gonna take the derivative with respect to? Well, we're maximizing the followers profits and recall that the amount that's produced by the leader is pre-announced. So it's basically just a number. We don't, we're not specifying what that number is, but at the time that the follower makes its decision, the amount produced by the leader is set. It's some number. So what we're gonna do is we're going to take the derivative with respect to Q with an F subscript to maximize the followers profits, treating the amount produced by the leader as a constant. So we're just gonna leave that variable in throughout as we solve this problem. Okay, so let's do, uh, let's take the derivative, take the partial derivative of the followers profit function. Um, with respect to the amount produced by the follower. And that's going to be equal to uh, 30 minus Q with an L subscript, not minus the amount produced by the follower, minus two times the quantity produced by the follower. So it's, sorry, it's 30 minus the quantity produced by the leader, minus two times the quantity produced by the follower. And what do we always do? Well, we set the derivative equal to zero. Remember, the derivative should be zero at a maximum or minimum. So we're gonna set the derivative equal to zero to find the value of the variable that maximizes this. Okay, so then the next question I have is what variable are we solving for? Well, we're maximizing the followers profits. We're trying to decide how much it wants to produce. And so we should be solving for QF. Okay, so let's do that. So we're gonna rearrange this equation to solve for QF. So we have, two, we could add two QF to both sides, yielding two QF is equal to 30 minus Q, oops, QL. And we could take that a step further by, uh, by dividing both sides by two. So divide both sides by two, we get that the amount that the follower should produce to maximize its profits is equal to uh, 15 minus one half times uh, the amount that the leader produces, okay? And this here, that is the reaction function. We've just maximized the follower's profits. It tells us how much the follower wants to produce to maximize its profits as a function of how much the leader has already announced and pre-committed to producing itself, okay? So this is the reaction function for the follower, a key input to solving the problem, uh, the overall oligopoly problem in the Stackelberg case. So let's look at this graphically. So here we have the reaction function for the follower plotted. So the vertical axis uh, corresponds to the amount that the follower elects to produce. And it's some function of the amount that the leader produces, which is denoted by the horizontal axis. Okay, so I wanna take a look at this. You know, it's relatively flat. There's sort of two main points here. So one is the follower, um, the amount that it produces depends on how much a leader produces. And in particular, that as the leader produces more, the follower produces less, right? As you move right horizontally along this graph, the height of this reaction function declines, indicating that the follower is producing less. Now, the key insight here is that this is actually gonna give the leader a greater incentive to produce more, right? Suppose that they were the only firm in the market or suppose that the follower didn't actually respond to the leader's choices. 
then if the leader were going to produce an additional unit, then there would be an additional unit in the market. And hence, the, uh, the market price would need to fall enough to accommodate an additional unit in this market, okay? But now let's think about what happens in this case when there's a follower. If the leader produces one more unit, we can see from this function that the follower will reduce how much it produces by half a unit. Hence, if the leader produces one more unit and the follower reduces how much it produces by half a unit, then as a leader produces one more unit, the total number sold in the market only increases by half a unit. So the market price only needs to fall enough to accommodate half an additional unit in this market. Right, so that means that that's going to give the leader firm a greater incentive to produce more because price doesn't fall as much as it increases its output. Okay. So now let's come back to this poll question. Recall I'm asking you whether the first firm, the leader, earns more or the follower earns more. So think about it for another 30 or 45 seconds or so. And then we'll go through how to actually finish solving this problem. Okay. okay, so the first thing that we're going to do to solve this problem, to figure out how much the leader is going to produce, is we want to write down the thing that the leader is trying to maximize or minimize. Which in this case is they're trying to maximize their profits. That will, that's what we normally assume that, the, um, uh, that a firm tries to do. So let's write down the leader's profit function. So we're going to have the profit of the leader is equal to the quantity that the leader produces times the market price. And again, we know what the market price is. We can just substitute in uh, the inverse demand function. So we can plug in for price that's equal to 30 minus the amount produced by the leader minus the amount produced by the follower. But beyond that, if the leader is smart, it knows that the follower is going to observe how much it produces and respond accordingly. And so if the leader is smart, it can figure out exactly how the follower will optimally respond. How will it respond? Well, it's going to respond according to its reaction function. So we can actually plug in exactly how the follower is going to respond or exactly how much its quantity produced is a function of the leader's output by plugging in this, re this reaction function. Right? The leader's gonna want to account for the fact that if it produces more, the follower is going to produce a little bit less. Okay, so we can rewrite this as that it's equal to the amount produced by the leader times the price, which is 30 minus the amount produced by the leader minus the amount produced by the follower. But recall that the amount produced by the follower is simply gonna be equal to 15 minus one half times the amount produced by the leader. So now we've written down the leader's profit function and in it, we've actually accounted for how the follower will respond, right? The leader should account for how the follower's output depends on the amount it produces. Since we plugged in the reaction function, we have now done so in the leader's profit function. Okay, so now what the next step is, what's always the next step? Once we have the thing that they're trying to maximize or minimize, of course, we take the derivative and we set it equal to zero. So let's do that now. We're going to take the derivative. Uh, I guess I don't need to do that. It's just, um, it's not a partial derivative because there's only one variable. So it's going to be the derivative of this profit of the leader with respect to the quantity that the leader produces. Okay, so all I have to do is take the derivative. That's going to be equal to 30 minus 2QL minus 15 plus QL is equal to zero. Right? We always set the derivative equal to zero. We can simplify this a little bit. We can get that 15 minus QL is equal to zero. Or Q 
QL is equal to 15. So now we know how much the leader will produce. Okay, let me just go back through these steps. We wrote down the leader's profit function. We plugged in for the inverse demand function. So we got price in terms of the quantities produced by the two firms. And then the leader knows or should know how the follower will respond. We plugged in the reaction function for the amount produced by the follower. Now we have one profit function, which depends on just the variable that the leader is choosing, its quantity. Okay. Once we have the profit function, then it's usually pretty easy. We take the derivative, set it equal to zero, and solve for QL. Now that we know how much the leader produces, how do we figure out how much the follower produces? That's right. We have the follower's reaction function, so we could plug this leader's quantity of 15 into it. Okay, remember that the follower's reaction function is equal to 15 minus 1 half oops, times the amount produced by the leader. Okay, if we plug that in, it's 15 minus 1 half times 15 equal to 7.5. So here we see that the leader actually produces more than the follower does. And because they both sell their product at the same price, and we've assumed that marginal cost and total cost for that sake is zero, it must be that the firm that produces more earns higher profits. So the leader is acting first and earning higher profits. So in other examples, it might not always be that the first firm to act or the first player to act in the game is at an advantage. But here we can see clearly that being able to commit in advance is actually more profitable than being the firm who gets to react afterwards. Okay, so that's the answer to the poll question that I have been uh, posing earlier.